Uh, I would like to to say firstly that uh, I'm very happy to to be here in Korea. It's my first time in this country, so I I'm very grateful to the organizers, especially Jürgen, Bernd, and Professor Su for the invitation. Uh, so uh, in this talk, my aim is to make some advertising of this word or, or these two words here. So uh, I think it should be clear to the audience that uh, there are very interesting types of hop real hypersurfaces, for example in some certain symmet Hermitian symmetric spaces or color manifolds. But it is also true that there are important classes of non-hop real hypersurfaces uh, that uh, deserve being studied. Uh, it's true that uh, if one wants to study real hypersurfaces in color manifolds in general, uh, this is a very difficult task. Uh, and uh, it's useful to impose the condition of being hop because that makes the things easier, although it still allows to obtain interesting examples. But if we focus on s uh, some manifold that uh, has um, lots of symmetries and a nice curvature tensor, as in the case of complex space forms, then maybe one, sh one could uh, attempt to tr try to uh, investigate uh, no-hop hypersurfaces. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I want to, to tell you in this talk is to give you some uh, interesting examples of no-hop real hypersurfaces in the non-flat complex space forms, particularly related to uh, homogeneous hypersurfaces, although I, I won't spend much time here, homogeneous hypersurfaces, then isoparametric hypersurfaces, and uh, lastly, um, let's say real hypersurfaces with a bound on the number of principal curvatures, bound on the number of principal curvatures, which I will denote by G, as in the talk by Professor on Onita. In this case, the bound I will consider simply uh, 2, or e exactly J equal to G equal to 2. Okay, so uh, simply recall that well, my setting will be non a non-flat complex space form, which is uh, uh, a, Keller, a, a simply connected Keller manifold with constant holomorphic sectional curvature. Uh, these spaces are classified according to this constant holomorphic sectional curvature C. If C is positive, we get a complex projective space. If C is zero, we get a complex Euclidean space. I will disregard this, ca this case. And if C is negative, I'll get a, a complex hyperbolic space. So sometimes I will denote by M bar to C a complex uh, space form. N, sorry of dimension n and uh, uh, holomorphic sectional curvature uh, c. Okay. Uh, as usual, I will denote by j the complex structure or Keller structure. Maybe I I'm not sure I'll need the levitch vita connection uh, associated with the metric we have in here, the Keller metric. Of course, the fact that uh, this is a Keller manifold basically means that uh, the covariant derivative of the complex structure is zero. Okay, so we want to uh, study real hi hypersurfaces here, so recall that uh, a real hypersurface, I will denote it generically by M, 
is a sort of manifold of, in this case of this uh, complex space, space form, uh, with, re with real co-dimension one. Okay, so the important thing here is to start by considering uh, psi a unit normal vector field uh, on M or let's say on an open part of N. Uh, so we'll notice the difference between the, my notation and the notation in most of the other talks. Uh, we'll denote by psi the normal vector field and simply by j of psi uh, certain tangent vector which is called the Hopf or rep or structure uh, vector field of the real hypersurface M. So the situation is that we have a real hypersurface M, we take uh, normal vector field, unit normal vector field, we ap apply the complex structure and this gives us a tangent vector field, j of psi, and this, uh, uh, for me, this will be the hop vector field. And I don't write here the minus because I don't have sentimental reasons to do that. But <laughs> uh, okay. Um, and now we have the, the first important definition, which is the definition of hi hop hypersurface. So we say that M is half if uh, J of psi, the half vector field, is an eigenvector of the shape operator or Weingarten map of M. At every point, okay? So, but if we want to study no hop real hypersurfaces, it's good to introduce a certain function that will play an important that plays an important role in the study of these hypersurfaces, uh, a similar role to G, uh, and uh, but one can say that even more important to G in the setting of uh, complex space forms. And uh, let me define this function. So I call it H. It's defined on the hypersurface and it takes va values in the uh, positive uh, uh, integer numbers and we define it as so um, h of p is of a point p is the number of non-trivial projections of the hop vector field, J psi, onto the principal curvature spaces. That is, onto the eigenspaces of the shape operator at P. Okay. So, maybe J of psi has projection onto exactly one principal curvature space. So this is precisely this situation. So uh, M is Hopf if and only if H is constantly equal to one along the hypersurface. If Hopf, uh, I sorry, if uh, the Hopf vector field J of Psi projects non-trivially onto two, let's say, um, principal curvature spaces, then we say that H is two and so, so, and so on. Okay. Well, so these are the basic definitions. And now I start with homogeneous hypersurfaces. So, homogeneous hypersurfaces. So, a homogeneous hypersurface is an orbit of uh, an isometric action on our ambient manifold. So we say that our hypersurface M is homogeneous, extrinsically homogeneous if you want to distinguish, to distinguish this concept from the notion of intrinsically homogeneity, 
which is the usual one. But in our case, we will simply say that our hypersurface is homogeneous if M is an orbit of an isometric action on the ambient manifold, which I denote by M bar on the ambient manifold. So this means that there exists a group G, a subgroup of the isometry group of the ambient manifold, such that we have this action, the canonical action on the ambient manifold via isometries. Mm -hmm. And of, co of course, this is an isometric action. These maps are uh, induced by each isometry, are isom uh, isometries, of course. So this is an isometric action. And uh, each one of the orbits of such an action is called an, an, a homogeneous submanifold. If it happens that one of these orbits is a hypersurface, it has codimension one, then we obtain a homogeneous hypersurface. Another equivalent definition is that we have a hypersurface and for every two points of the hypersurface we can find a, an isometry not of the hypersurface but of the ambient manifold that maps one point to the other point. Okay, uh, an important first observation is that f in every uh, Riemannian manifold, if we have a homogeneous hypersurface, then this hypersurface has constant principal curvatures. And it is moreover isoparametric with the definition I will give you in a couple of minutes. Isoparametric. However, the converse in principle is not true and in fact it is not true in, in general. Okay. So I don't want to spend uh, a long time sp speaking about homogeneous hypersurfaces because I prefer to focus on isoparametric hypersurfaces and on real hypersurfaces with two principal curvatures. But simply let me say that in the context we are interested in, that is on non-flat complex space forms, homogeneous hypersurfaces have been classified. So in CPN, in the projective case, uh, all these hypersurfaces are Hopf hypersurfaces. And in the complex hyperbolic space, there are Hopf examples. But there are as well no Hopf examples. Okay, so the Hopf examples in both cases are precisely the real hypersurfaces uh, explained by Professor Juan de Dios Pérez on Monday. So these are well-known examples. These known Hopf examples were constructed by Lonher, Bernd and, and Brook uh, around 2000 and will arise as a particular case of a construction I will present in this section now soon. So this gives us an idea that, well, uh, hypersurfaces are important because uh, homogeneous hypersurfaces are an important um, ob objects to study and in the projective case all homogeneous hypersurfaces are Hopf, but in the uh, hyperbolic case we uh, have no Hopf examples so this tells us that we should study as well no Hopf real hypersurfaces. Okay, so uh, now let me move on to the second part of the talk. I want to speak a little bit about isoparametric hypersurfaces, in particular in uh, non flat complex space forms, and in particular in the complex hyperbolic space. So for me, since, uh, since I work in a, sp in a Riemannian manifold of non-constant curvature, I need the following definition of isoparametric hypersurface. 
So M will be an isoparametric hypersurface. If M and its uh, nearby equidistant or parallel, if you want, hypersurfaces, hypersurfaces have all of them constant mean curvature. This is a local definition. Okay. And locally, this definition is equivalent to the existence of an isoparametric map as defined by Professor Miyaoka yesterday. Okay. So this means that we have a hypersurface that is not uh, alone there. Uh, uh, next to it, we have a family of parallel hypersurfaces, all of them with constant mean curvature. This doesn't mean that we can extend this foliation globally to the ambient manifold. But what happens in the cases we are interested in is that we can extend this foliation to a singular Riemannian foliation. That is, there can be a couple of singular orbits, or, or, or sorry, singular leaves, leaves with higher codimension. Okay. Okay, so once we have this, re, re, I remind you that an important set of examples of isoparametric hypersurfaces is given by homogeneous hypersurfaces, orbits of homogeneity com one actions. Well, what happens, le, uh, I want to focus on complex space forms, but uh, I think in this case it's important to s say a word about uh, isoparametric hypersurfaces in real space forms, in spaces of constant curvature. So the first thing, the first important thing is that Eli Cartan in the 30s proved that uh, if we are in a, com in a space of constant curvature, let's say a Euclidean space, a sphere, or a real hyperbolic space, then isoparametric is equivalent to having constant principal curvatures. So, and this is the reason why Professor Onita yesterday defined isoparametric uh, as a hypersurface with constant principal curvatures because he was working on the setting of the spheres. Okay, uh, so this um, tells us that this notion is quite, quite restrictive. And in fact, this uh, allows, uh, allowed uh, Elie Cartan to prove certain formula for the involving the principal curvatures of an isoparametric hypersurface. And this allowed him to uh, obtain the classification in hyperbolic spaces. The classification here uh, was due to Segre as uh, explained by Jürgen Berndt and here by Cartan. What are the examples? In the, in the real Euclidean space, the examples are simply uh, hyperplanes, spheres, or generalized uh, cylinders. Okay. And the classification in the hyperbolic case is quite similar. In the Poincaré uh, disk model, uh, it will be horospheres. Uh, again, similarly, geodesic spheres. Or mm, tubes around totally geodesic uh, real hyperbolic subspaces. Let's say tubes around totally geodesic RHK. Okay, so all, all of these examples are homogeneous hypersurfaces. So this uh, gives us the classification of homogeneous hypersurfaces in uh, real Euclidean and hyperbolic spaces. However, the case of spheres is much more involved. Uh, Elie Cartan did some uh, work on this, but he was not able to classify these uh, hypersurfaces. And in fact, this is a very important problem in differential geometry. Uh, and it's uh, still open. Although uh, the only case, so the only case that remains open is uh, 
on the sphere of dimension 31. So, and basically there, there were some very important uh, works in the last seven years, one of them due to Professor Miyaoka here, uh, that uh, allows us to say that this classification is almost done, although it's still open. Okay, the important thing here is that uh, on the contrast with this case and this case, there are non-homogeneous, I will say inhomogeneous isoparametric hypersurfaces. That is, uh, hi isoparametric hypersurfaces which are not orbits of isometric actions. And all the examples known so far, and probably all examples, uh, were constructed by Ferrus, Karcher and Münzner in the 80s, I think, using Clifford modules. Okay, so uh, one of the things, uh, the reasons why this problem in spheres is important is this thing here, the existence of inhomogeneous examples. Okay, so let's move on to complex, non-flat complex space forms. And say uh, if we can, uh, and see if we can say things about isoparametric hypersurfaces, real hypersurfaces in this case. There. So first, in complex projective spaces, uh, it turns out that um, there are again inhomogeneous isoparametric hypersurfaces. inhomogeneous examples and all of these inhomogeneous examples have non-constant principal curvatures. Which is a difference with the case of spheres. Okay. Uh, if you want, uh, how can one construct these examples? The idea in order to study isoparametric hypersurfaces in complex projective spaces is to use the hop vibration. So if, for example, you take one inhomogeneous example here, uh, you can see that uh, this hypersurface is foliated by the fibers of this projection. You can project it down and you obtain an inhomogeneous isoparametric hypersurface with non-constant principal curvatures on CPM. But the surprising thing is that there are homogeneous uh, hypersurfaces here uh, in, in the sphere that can be projected to inhomogeneous hypersurfaces here. This is a strange phenomenon. And in fact, two years ago, I could obtain an almost complete classification of uh, isoparametric hypersurfaces in complex projective spaces for all dimensions different from 15. And of course, this 15 is related to this open case here. However, this classification doesn't follow straightforward from the classification in the spheres because one has to understand this strange property here. And may another phenomenon that appears here is that we, given an isoparametric hypersurface upstairs, one can project it to at least, or to more than one non-congruent isoparametric hypersurfaces downstairs. Okay. And of course, these examples are non-hop. These inhomogeneous examples. So let me move on to the hyperbolic case. Here I'll spend some more time, I think. And here, uh, one could uh, try to use the same idea to use the hop vibration, but in this case the problem is that uh, the total space of this vibration is the anti sitter space. And this is a Lorentzian space form. So it has constant curvature, but it is Lorentzian, so this makes things more complicated. So it's not so easy to uh, try to uh, use this approach because the uh, first reason is that we don't have a classification of iso Lorentzian isoparametric hypersurfaces here. But what one can try to do is to uh, get examples. 
and what I'm going to do in the, la in the next uh, minutes is to give you a construction of new uh, isoparametric hypersurfaces uh, which are uh, non-homogeneous non because the homogeneous are known. So the idea to construct these uh, examples is the following, is to use certain model for these spaces which I call the solvable model and I'll explain what this means. So this means that every complex hyperbolic space of every dimension, of it, any dimension, is isometric to some Lie group, which I will denote by AN, endowed with a left invariant metric. Well, not G, but let me say simply the same in a product. This is a left invariant metric on this Lie group, which is a solvable Lie group. So A stands for an abelian Lie group and N for a nilpotent Lie group. So let me uh, describe a little bit the Lie algebra of this Lie group. So I will denote it by Gothic A plus Gothic N. So A is a one-dimensional Lie algebra, so obviously abelian. And N is nilpotent. And what I'm going to do is to decompose N into uh, the orthogonal direct sum, orthogonal with respect to this uh, metric, this inner product, of its center, the center of this Lie algebra, plus some uh, complementary orthogonal subspace that I will denote by uh, V. OK. So this is the center of N. And this is a orthogonal direct sum. Okay. Well, it turns out that this center has dimension one. Mm -hmm. So it happens that this V can be identified with a complex Euclidean space of dimension n minus 1. So one complex dimension less than the dimension of uh, our complex hyperbolic space. OK. And uh, one, can, one has here, one can uh, calculate the Lie bracket on this Lie algebra. And the properties I need are simply that um, uh, that A maps any vector x in V or in Z to uh, uh, a proportional vector to, to itself. And, uh, and the Lie bracket of V with elements in V with elements in B goes inside the center. Okay. So, what we have is a Lie group uh, we, which admits this, uh, whose Lie algebra admits this decomposition. And this is, can be identified with a Cn minus 1. Okay, so this is the thing we have to keep in mind. So, now I give you the construction. Take any W, any subspace of V and any proper subspace. So W different from the whole V. Mm -hmm. So we take something here. And we define S as A plus W plus uh, the center. So we simply took the whole the algebra and removed some non-trivial part here. Using this, you can easily check that this is a Lie algebra. This, sorry, Lie subalgebra of uh, it's a Lie subalgebra of a plus n. Well, if we have a Lie subalgebra of a plus n, we can consider the corresponding connected subgroup of uh, AN with Lie algebra S. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So we have a subgrouping here. That is, now we move on, let's say, to the Riemannian setting, uh, setting of Riemannian geometry, and what we have is a submanifold of the complex hyperbolic space. Okay? So this is, uh, I denote it by S, this connected subgroup, and this is a, a submanifold of CHN. Well, the interesting thing, the first interesting thing is that this submanifold is a minimal submanifold. Minimal submanifold, this means constant mean curvature equals to zero. One can easily prove this because we have a, a, a Lie group with a left invariant metric. We can use the Kossul formula to obtain the levi civita connection on this Lie group and then calculate the shape operator of this uh, submanifold. It is a homogeneous submanifold by construction. It is an orbit of a, a, an isometric action, in fact, the isometric action of this group S, because AN is made of isometries. Okay, and the most interesting thing is the theorem, which I proved with my advisor, Carlos Diaz Ramos, uh, two or three years ago is that uh, the tubes around this submanifolds around S are always isoparametric hypersurfaces. They, are, they have constant mean curvature since they are equidistant to each other, they are isoparametric. And moreover, among these examples, one can characterize those that have constant uh, principal curvatures. So it happens that these tubes, tubes have constant principal curvatures if and only if they are homogeneous hypersurfaces. And if and only if the following condition occurs. Uh, w perp, which I define as the orthogonal comp sorry, the orthogonal complement of yeah of W in V, this denotes orthogonal complement, has constant Keller angle has constant Keller angle as a subspace of V. Uh, I will explain this in a second. But let me say firstly that when this Keller angle is independent of uh, uh, the unit vector psi that we take in W perp, we say that W perp has constant Keller angle. Okay, so, uh, uh, and this is the property we use there. So, uh, two examples. If W perp has constant Keller angle pi over 2, this is equivalent to the fact that W perp is a totally r real subspace of uh, V. And if W perp has constant Keller angle 0, this is equivalent to the fact that W perp is a complex subspace of V. However, there are subspaces, this is, uh, W perp in V, with constant Keller angle phi in uh, 0 pi over 2. Mm -hmm. And these are, uh, well, together with the one in pi over 2, the angles that in this construction give us uh, homogeneous hypersurfaces which are non hopf but uh, any uh, generic, a generic subspace W perp of V does not need to have a um, constant Keller angle. If we take one of these generic subspaces of V, then we obtain uh, inhomogeneous isoparametric via that construction, isoparametric hypersurfaces, all of them with non-constant principal curvature.
by the characterization. And the difference, for example, with the inhomogeneous examples in, in spheres is that here we have uh, uncountably many uh, congruence classes of, uh, let's say, isoparametric foliations. Okay. Simply let me mention that this construction can be extended, for example, to quaternionic hyperbolic spaces or to the Cayley hyperbolic space. Okay, so I finished with this part. So I will present you now. So of course these are no half. I will move on now to the last part, which is a relatively different problem. So imagine that we take a complex space form CPN or CHN of complex dimension N and we take a real hypersurface there. Then this real hypersurface has dimension 2N minus 1. Then uh, if this hypersurface is generic it should have 2N minus 1 principal curvatures, distinct principal curvatures if it is generic. But if we r impose the condition that this real hypersurface has less than 2n mi minus 1 principal curvatures, then one should expect to obtain uh, some very particular examples or some rigid rigidity results. So this is the problem I want to address in this last part of the talk, but in a very uh, uh, particular way. Uh, I will just consider hypersurfaces with two principal curvatures in CPN and CHN. So the first, the first, uh, so now uh, the section could be called hypersurfaces with two principal curvatures in CPN and CHN, and in fact, as I'll explain soon, in, s in the planes, that is for n equals Two. So, um, the first observation is that it is known that uh, there are no umbilic real hypersurfaces here in CPN and CHN. So, this means umbilic means one principal curvature. So, that's the reason why I start with G equals two. Well, uh, in fact, some uh, mathematicians started before, in fact, uh, some decades ago. Cecil and Ryan, and then I think this is, was around the 80s. Montiel, this for CPN and Montiel for CHN. They proved that a real hypersurface with two principal curvatures. Uh, in CPN or CHN is Hopf and homogeneous. So it's one of the hypersurfaces presented uh, by Juan de Dios uh, on Monday. But the problem is that this is only valid if n is greater or equal than 3. So it is not, the, the, the arguments are not valid for uh, the complex projective and hyperbolic planes. So this uh, motivated uh, a question in a famous survey by uh, Ryan, Nieberg and Ryan. A survey proposed this question. Are there Mm, non-standard, let's say, non-homogeneous or non-hop real hypersurfaces with two principal curvatures in CP2 and CH2. So I think some mathematicians try to give an answer to this and uh, for example, in my case, I, uh, I, I thought I would expect that the answer to this question would be no, that uh, the only example should be uh, the homogeneous and Hopf examples. However, uh, we found a method to, to address this problem, and uh, we discovered that there are 
many examples, many new examples. So this, the answer to this question is yes. And this is a very recent joint work with my advisor, Jose Carlos Diaz Ramos, and our uh, master student, Cristina Vidal Castineira, who is right now in Barcelona. Okay, so uh, in order to describe the example, so I'll simply describe the examples, give you an idea of the construction, which is surprisingly easy. And I hope you can understand it. If you don't, uh, please tell me, because uh, it's very easy. Uh, I need to recall a notion from the talk by Andreas Kolros, the notion of polar action. So, an isometric action is said to be polar. So, so we have an isometric action, let's say, let, let me write simply H. The group H, an isometry, a uh, group of isometries H acting on the ambient manifold, in this case our complex space form, is an isometric action. Isometric action such that there exists a section for this action and this means the following uh, tot uh, a totally geodesic submanifold which I will denote by sigma uh, of uh, the ambient manifold intersecting all orbits, all the orbits of the action and always orthogonally. Mm -hmm. So the typical example is the one suggested by polar coordinates in in R2, for example. Okay, and uh, I need the, the notion of regular point. This might not be um, exactly standard, but uh, uh, the, the, uh, when one speaks about uh, isometric actions, there is a notion of principal orbit, which I will not introduce. But in this case, in the case of polar actions, let's say principal orbit is the same as uh, orbit of maximal dimension. So for us, let us make this identification, principal orbit, because I, I will probably speak about principal orbits and I don't want you to get lost. Principal orbit is orbit of maximal dimension. And now I need a definition of regular point P in sigma if P belongs to a principal orbit. <coughs> okay, so it is in a it lies in a submanifold with uh, the smallest co-dimension. Okay. So now Polar actions on complex space forms. These were classified. So, for so polar actions on CPN and CHN. So, in CPN. This is due to Podesta and Torbersson. And in CHN, it is due to uh, my advisor myself and uh, Andreas. But the, the thing is that we are interested only in the case n equals 2. And in this case, here we have this classification by Podesta and Torbison, and in this case, this was previously obtained by Jürgen Berndt and Diaz Ramos. Okay, which are the examples we have? In CPN, we only have one example, let's say, up to orbit equivalence. So 
In CPN, the only example of polar action is the one given by the action of U1 times U1 times U1 on CP2. So how is the, how does, um, uh, let's, let's see, uh, let's explain a little bit about the, the, this action. So this group acts, uh, acts, and I write with this uh, arrow the, denote the action, uh, on C3, the complex Euclidean space of complex dimension 3, uh, in the canonical way. So uh, it also acts on the unit sphere. Uh, which is the five-dimensional sphere. Okay. Then we have the hop vibration to CP2. And one can easily see that this action descends to an action on CP2, CP2 which is isometric because these are made of uh, unitary uh, transformations. So we have this action which is polar. Okay. This action, we also have it in the hyperbolic case, but in this case we have to consider the anti sitter space, but we also have this action in CH2. So, but in, in CH2 there are uh, four uh, polar actions. Well, I'm, uh, let me say that I'm restricting, I forgot to say that, I'm restricting to the case where polar actions have homogeneity too. This means that the section has dimension 2. Or if you want, that the principal orbits have dimension two, 4 minus 2 equals 2. Uh, this, so, and uh, the sections in this case are totally geodesic. R A, uh, sorry, R, R P2 or R H2 respectively. Okay. So in, in CH2 there are four polar actions up to orbit equivalence of, co of homogeneity 2, of co homogeneity 2 on CH2. One of them is given by U1, 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 similarly as for CP2. Okay, so um, the, the others are a little bit more complicated, but uh, that's not the point. It's not very important to, to understand these actions. The important thing is to have the, uh, in mind that we have an isometric action, which is polar, that is, that we have a section, a totally geodesic submanifold, uh, which is two-dimensional, and which is an RP2 or an RH2. Okay. So uh, we start with such an action of homogeneity too. So we have H uh, subgroup of isometries of isometries of CP2 or CH2 or CH2 acting polarly with homogeneity too. Okay, and section sigma. Okay, so imagine that this is our section sigma. And if you want, uh, if you want to fix ideas, you can think that this H is this U1 times U1 times U1. And uh, if you want, we you can restrict to the projective case, for example. And in this case, this should be an R P2 or in the hyperbolic case, an RH2. Okay, so now imagine that we take here any curve, in principle, any curve in this section. Okay, and now we consider through each one of the points of the curve the uh, orbit of the action of H that goes through this point. So, we have picture like this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we attach to the curve this H orbits. 
So imagine this is the point P, so this is the orbit H through P. And this gives us a hypersurface, a real hypersurface. So formally, I define the hypersurface H dot gamma as the points H of gamma T, where H is in the group, and uh, t is in minus epsilon epsilon if this is the interval where the gamma is defined. So gamma is defined in this interval. In fact, I, I suppose that gamma is defined in the, reg in the regular points of this, uh, of the section. Okay, so this is a real hypersurface. The question is, can we find a curve such that this hypersurface has two principal curvatures at every point. So the idea, this idea is quite simple and it's the following. The first fact, we, we simply need one fact, is that um, the principal curvatures, curvatures of the orbits through of, of the orbits, any orbit of this action, for example, in, in the case of U1, 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 these are flat tori. Okay? But the principal curvatures of uh, any uh, principal orbit of any of these polar actions are always different for every uh, normal vector. Uh, let's say psi. So, uh, notice that these orbits are two-dimensional. We, we are in a manifold of dimension four. So we have, uh, let's say, an S1 of uh, unit normal vector fields. So for each one of these normal vector fields, we have, uh, in principle, two cur principal curvatures that might, might coincide. What I'm saying is that they do not coincide. Okay? So uh, we can say that we have two principal curvatures, alpha and beta, defined, let's say, in the uh, tangent space to sigma rec, let's say. To, uh, tan sorry, tangent uh, bundle to sigma rec. This simply means that to, we have here a point and a vector in this point, and we have the, 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 the principal curvature corresponding to this normal vector. Okay. So the idea is, let us take gamma such that its curvature as a curve in this surface sigma has curvature beta, for example, or alpha, but let me take it beta. So take gamma in sigma such that its curvature is uh, given by beta. If you want beta, and I have to specify the normal vector. Okay, so I take gamma and I take uh, mm, uh, a vector field along gamma and a normal, ve normal vector field. but tangent normal to gamma, but tangent to sigma. Okay, so the situation is very easy. It's simply I take psi like this. Okay, so I impose this condition that the, pre the curvature of gamma coincides with beta with respect to this normal vector. Mm -hmm. If uh, I impose this condition, th this means simply that we have the levi civita connection and the curvature, uh, let's say this derivative is given by beta psi of t, uh, psi of t. Okay, so we have this. But then what happens is that uh, the principal curvatures Uh, of the hypersurface at a point gamma of t are 
uh, alpha with respect to psi of t, beta with respect to psi of t, because be, the, the, these two principal curvatures come from the principal curvatures of this tori, let's say, of these principal orbits. And then the, we, it happens that the other principal curvature is given by this uh, curvature, which is beta again. So this has multiplicity too. The reason for this is that let us calculate the shape operator of our hypersurface H gamma with respect to the normal vector. The normal vector in this case is the psi. Okay, so the shape operator with respect to psi of a, a normal vector, a tangent vector, which in this case I need to calculate this. So this is by definition the derivative of psi with respect to uh, gamma dot. Uh, okay, and now simply uh, let me calculate this inner product. With the inner product with psi is uh, is zero because psi is unit vector, and uh, with gamma, I simply uh, do this. Uh, move the derivative to the other side, I get minus psi, and then I substitute by my condition, I get beta psi, so I get minus beta psi, I see since I forgot the minus here, I obtain beta, uh, sorry, beta, beta, and I'm taking the inner product with gamma, so I, here I obtain beta gamma. So. Uh, I prove that the other principal curvature is given by beta. So the hypersurface has two principal curvatures. And in, uh, I have uh, one minute. So uh, in one minute, I just want to say that generically, such uh, hypersurfaces are no hops. And with non constant principal curvatures, so in particular they are not homogeneous. And moreover, now we have the converse, which is the difficult part of the theorem. So uh, any uh, real hypersurface in CA, CP2 or CH2 which uh, with two principal curvatures at every point and no hop at every point uh, if I assume to be uh, if I assume to be it to be hop then we know the classification so I assume it to be no hop at every point then it is one of this. So uh, there is a polar action on CP2 or CH2 acti uh, acting with cohomogeneity 2 and some section sigma. And in this section, there exists through each regular point, there are two curves such that this hypersurface have two principal curvatures. Why two curves? Beca because here, in the construction, we made a choice. The choice is, was that we chose beta to, to be the, 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 uh, the, the principal curvature with multiplicity 2 and not alpha. If we had chosen alpha, then we would obtain a different hypersurface. Uh, okay, so I'll finish here. So thank you very much.